right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, hope you all enjoyed all the workshops yesterday and really excited today to have Don Kelly from the Protocol Labs team with Developer Advocate uh, here to share everything that they're working on. And I'm uh, really excited to have you with us, Don. Hey, Patrick, even your video intro music is based. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, whenever you're ready, we'll go. Cool. Ready yeah, for let's do, uh... That's my big face. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Okay, all right, let me go, there we go. All right guys, so I have two monitors going once in a while, you'll see me kind of looking up and doing just because I'm changing slides, so all right. Hello builders, uh, my name is Dawn Kelly. I'm a developer advocate at Filecoin Foundation and my pronouns are she, her. I am super excited to be here with you today. I want to thank Chainlink for having me here for this workshop as part of the Chainlink Fall 2022 Hackathon. Uh, just a little about me, I am a registered nurse turned community taught software developer who fell down the Web3 rabbit hole fairly early in my learning journey. Uh, my deepest knowledge does come from the decentralized universe, so I like to refer to myself as a Web3 native developer. I'm a digital nomad sharing a uh, motorhome RV with my graphic designer wife and my two spoiled dogs. And uh, we are currently in sunny Las Vegas, which is great. Uh, I've been lots of places, I've done lots of things. So I am passionate about helping non-traditional background and underrepresented minority people find their place in the Web3 landscape. Uh, my role as a developer advocate gives me a lot of fulfilling opportunities to draw upon this passion, such as being here with you all today. Uh, this workshop will focus on some potential hackathon project ideas, as well as a brief overview of IPFS and Filecoin. Uh, we'll also cover helpful hints on how to make sure your project is qualified for Filecoin bounties and how to put your best foot forward when presenting your submission. So let's get into it. All right, so you've entered this hackathon. Uh, you've attended some team forming sessions probably. You're ready to get down to business, but first you have to figure out a few things. Um, what on earth should you build? How can you make sure your project will qualify for the awesome prizes that are up for grabs? And what can you do to make your project presentation as effective as possible? All right, so some recent research into hackathon participants found there are three main categories of participants. Uh, the first group is here to learn more about Web3 technology and ecosystems. Uh, these learners might be experienced Web2 engineers who are Web3 curious. Some of them are crypto or NFT traders who want to learn how things work under the hood. Uh, either way, they want to learn how this blockchain stuff works and build something while they do it. The second group is here to explore or seek employment. A number of these folks are also Web2 engineers, but they're exploring the leap from Web3 side hustle to full-time employment in the space. Uh, we're starting to see more and more non-engineers in this category as well. I'm about to give you a, a total hackathon life hack here. Content creators, community managers, marketers, and product managers are among some of those that we're seeing uh, pop up in hackathons lately. And savvy teams would be well served to seek one of these folks out when they are building their team. Uh, they may not be able to write code, but they can focus on their area of expertise and free your developers up to do what they do best. The third group are what I call our founders and funders. Uh, these individuals have their sights set on launching a startup, a SaaS, or a similar type of business. They sometimes arrive with their own team, but other times they may be looking for a co-founder or to build out their team. Uh, these teams sometimes see the presentation process as an opportunity to practice their pitch, uh, test market fit based on feedback, and they may be hoping to bump into potential investors or make some new connections for collaboration. Um, I would also put our individual developers who are trying to win bounties in order to support their freelance Web3 work in this category as well. Uh, these groups will often differ in how important bounties are to their project development process, and that's completely okay. Um, everyone has their own goals and the space is permissionless, so well, let's go. Any of the project ideas that I'm about to discuss can be undertaken by members of any of these groups. 
Uh, I've tried to put them in buckets that make the most sense in my brain, but don't let me put a limit on your imagination. Uh, experienced engineers who are Web3 curious will often find that turning a familiar Web2 concept into a decentralized Web3 application is a great entry point for learning about the space. Just think of an app you enjoy and how it might benefit from Web3 principles of decentralization, transparency, privacy, ownership of personal data and creations, along with permissionless and trustless interactions. Examples of possible projects would include applications to facilitate communication, such as social media and video chat, video streaming services, such as YouTube or Twitch, and vehicles which allow creators to capture the value of their creations, such as e-commerce and blogging platforms. If you're in that bucket of people looking to make Web3 your full-time gig, you're in the right place. Uh, hackathons were the thing that helped catapult me from dabbling freelancer to Web3 worker. The same was true for several of my friends and colleagues as well. Hackathons not only create an opportunity to interact with sponsor companies, you're also creating portfolio pieces at the same time. With that in mind, it never hurts to try to take on a known problem or pain point in the industry. It's a nice way to show sponsoring companies what you can do to solve a problem that they probably have right now. Uh, privacy has always been a hot topic in Web3. However, it's taken on a whole new level of significance in the current political climate. Applications which allow for private and anonymous communication, for example, would be very valuable for people such as those protesting in Iran. We know applications like Facebook have been caught giving up private message data more than once. In situations of political unrest, that kind of data can lead to imprisonment or even death for folks. Uh, the situation is an example showing we still have a long way to go in reaching our goals of a decentralized censorship resistant web. Uh, dev tooling is another big growth opportunity currently in the space. Uh, we've grown a lot since I started scraping the far corners of the internet looking for web free developer education content. Uh, and some of that early content was made by our friend Patrick Collins here, <laughs> uh, but we still do have a lot of work to do. Okay, you could be the one to build the next SDK or framework that makes decentralized development more accessible to traditional applications developers, and we'd love to see you do it. As I said before, anyone from any category can build any of these things. Um, I like to think of this last group, our founders and funders, is where we can talk about tackling the really big brain stuff. Uh, in his book, Green Pilled, Kevin Owaki shares a quote attributed to Anon, which I love. All coordination is a choice. We have to choose the future we want in the day-to-day -day choices we make, not only in the type of assets we buy, but also in where we put our scarce time, attention, and skills. Well, what does this mean, though? As a species, we're facing a stunning number of problems, which are adding up to pose a risk to our continuing to live life as we are. Uh, truly though, if we look around, it's not hard to see that the legacy ways of doing things are failing. And in many ways, humanity is not thriving right now. Uh, whether we are talking about political unrest, climate change and natural disasters, homelessness or food, food insecurity, these are all at their heart issues of coordination Examples I can give from my admittedly limited American point of view in the world, uh, we have billionaires in the same country as homeless people sleeping in tents. According to the FDA, we have 30 to 40% of food going to waste, while 10% of our families experience food insecurity. We have some of the best medical technology in the world, yet the CDC says close to 10% of us are uninsured, meaning that technology may as well not exist because it's basically inaccessible for a lot of us. None of this is a result of a lack of anything. These are symptoms of a failure to coordinate, to use our resources in a way that effectively helps the most people. If we can come together and agree to work on solving these type of problems, rather than simply grinding ourselves bloody, trying to accumulate as much stuff as possible, think about how much could change. What if you could form a decentralized reputation score, which removed the influence of outside parties like credit scores and banking from our financial transactions? What if you could cryptographically prove who a person is in order to facilitate electronic voting they can participate in right from their couch? 
These are examples of some of the big questions needing answers right now. Uh, if that all seems a little too lofty or it's just kind of not your thing, uh, you can always tackle user experience and interaction problems. Uh, current theory holds that a major roadblock to mainstream adoption of Web3 technology is the lack of a seamless user experience that mimics what consumers are used to from the Web2 platforms they use today. Uh, we've made a lot of strides on the developer experience side of this, but UX needs a lot of work still. <laughs> I think we can all agree. All right, so once you've developed your awesome project idea, you'll want to make sure that you build it in such a way that it qualifies for any bounty tracks you want to enter. Um, I'm going to speak specifically to the um, Filecoin and IPFS related bounty uh, tracks. And I did get a Discord message that I haven't had a chance to reply to yet, but you might be watching right now. Um, if you do win one of our main prizes, you're not... Um, prevented from also winning a bonus prize. So it is possible to hit both of those tracks um, if you are out there listening. I hope you'll get that answer, but I will answer you on Discord as well. <laughs> All right. So Filecoin is offering both overall prizes and bonus prizes for the Chainlink Fall Hackathon. Uh, our overall prize is our storage wizard. We're looking for the best use of NFT storage or Web3 storage to use IPFS for content addressing and Filecoin for persistent decentralized storage. Um, use of other tooling may qualify. I've seen a uh, lot more folks starting to use the IPFS client directly through our JS IPFS and our Go IPFS libraries, which is awesome. Um, if you are unsure if a tool or your specific usage would qualify, please reach out. Uh, we'll help evaluate that for you and make sure that you're, you're within what we're looking for. Uh, to make it as simple as I can, we're looking for usage which stores to and retrieves from IPFS or Filecoin from within your code. So if you're just kind of pulling images from a pinning service or similar, that's likely not going to be a strong enough usage. Uh, so what we're seeing here is we've got a first place of 10,000, a second place of 7,500, and a third place of 5,000. So those are pretty good. Um, for our bonus prizes, we're offering one $5,000 prize and one $2,500 prize for each of the following tracks. Uh, Web3FI, a daily use app, uh, social good, tooling, we've got a category that lumps in a bunch of things, uh, gaming, metaverse, DAOs, and NFTs, compute over data, and DeFi. So there are so many prizes. Uh, we now know that we need to use Filecoin, but how do we do that? What even is Filecoin? Is it the same as IPFS? Let's take a look and find out. Filecoin and IPFS are actually part of a larger organization and ecosystem with both of these projects originally incubated by Protocol Labs. Protocol Labs is a fully distributed open source R&D organization founded by Juan Benet in 2013, which builds protocols, tools, services and aims to help radically improve the internet and drive breakthroughs in computing, which can help move, move us and humanity forward. It's a mission shared throughout the organization in which we are genuinely driven by. Uh, IPFS and Filecoin are two of the projects that were originally incubated by Protocol Labs, and the Filecoin Foundation is the governance body behind the Filecoin Decentralized Storage Network. Ultimately, we are all about data. Go, slides, go. There we go. All right. I think we can all agree data is an absolutely essential part of our daily lives. Give me a second, guys. This window next to me is open and there's somebody doing something outside. There we go. All right. Whew. I think we can all agree data is an absolutely essential part of our daily lives. Not surprisingly, the development of tools to store and manage data is also a super fast growing field in Web3. Enabling distributed storage mechanisms can also help new applications and use cases to be built out with more performance, with trustlessness, and with more resilient outcomes and censorship resistant qualities. If we look at current models of data storage and sharing though, they mostly fit into a centralization model. There are only a few main companies that are offering storage, with some centralized companies having access and rights to our data via our social media or web profiles. 
Um, this is where I like to plug in that reminder that if you can't figure out how a company is making money, there's a decent chance that you're probably their product. <laughs> um, this does lead to several big issues. We've got centralized models create central points of failure. If a central server goes down, it can take whole services we rely on daily down with it. Um, if you think about that, we can tell if there's a day where a major AWS or Google server has gone down and it just kind of drags everything along. Um, centralized markets create attack vectors for data harvesting. Individuals and businesses both incur significant financial losses and loss of trust as a result of these attacks. Centralized models pose a censorship and misuse threat. We've all seen situations where information can be withheld or manipulated to sway voters, censor people's access to information, or otherwise create societal mistrust and problems. And lastly, centralized models have the power to decide who is allowed to store content with them, under what circumstances and how, leading to both vendor lock-in and a complete lack of data sovereignty. And these issues really lead to a question. Why aren't we designing the web for the autonomy and resilience we need in the first place? And how do we get to a world that has a resilient, performant, scalable, censorship resistant open web? So these are exactly the kind of problems we're working on solving at IPFS and Filecoin. So how does it all work? I'm going to start with IPFS, which is an initialism for the sci-fi sounding name, Interplanetary File System. Uh, that name is more than just a meme though. As a distributed peer-to-peer -peer network for files and folders, it was designed to be able to work even when the network is between planets. So uh, when you've eventually hopped a SpaceX rocket for a Mars colony program and you're happily living on the red planet, it might take you an hour or so to request a file you need from Earth. But if someone else on Mars already has that file, then that person can serve that content to you instantly instead. Uh, at this point, this may sound like just a fancy way to describe a peer-to-peer -peer network, but there is real power behind what it does. IPFS is distributed by design, has no central authority servers, is designed to be offline first for resilience, and uses a really unique and upgradable standard for addressing content. IPFS makes me thirsty, y'all. All right, so IPFS is unique because it addresses content by what it is instead of where it is. What does this mean? We are mostly familiar with location or path-based addressing for storing and accessing content. This would be things like the file path to where an item is stored on your computer or location paths pointing to HTTP addresses. These addresses tell you where to look, but there's no way to know if the expected content will be there until you go to the location. IPFS uses content addressing. With a content ID, which you'll see me calling CID, you have assurance you are getting the same material back every time. This means anyone storing that matching CID can serve the material to you regardless of where it is stored. Um, my favorite way to explain this difference was uh, born out of me attempting to explain to my teen boys what it is I do for my job exactly. Uh, it goes like this. So imagine you and I are besties and I'm sad because I am out of the world's best breakfast cereal. Uh, you're an amazing friend and you want to go get a new box for me to cheer me up because you're a good human being. So you ask me what to get and I tell you, go into the grocery store, find aisle six, and get a box of cereal from the third shelf, eight boxes from the right-hand end of the aisle. So you are highly likely to follow these instructions precisely and still come back with the wrong cereal. Uh, maybe the night stock crew reorganized the aisles. Maybe they're out of the best breakfast cereal in the world. I don't know what might happen in a grocery store some days, but what I do know is I'm probably not gonna get my cereal this way. Okay, so if we try it now the content addressing way, you want to get the cereal to cheer me up, so you ask me what to get, and I tell you, the greatest breakfast cereal of all time is called Reese's Puffs. The box is orange, and it has a large picture of a bowl with the cereal on the front. The last numbers of the UPC are 5034 for the 11 and a half ounce box. Ha! So now you know exactly what you're looking for, and your odds of success are greatly increased. 
you can scan the aisle for orange boxes and then use the picture name and UPC code to verify you're selecting the correct cereal. You may even get lucky and find a box on display at the front of the store. And you don't even have to make the trip to the cereal aisle. It is kind of wild uh, how just shifting the focus from a location-based address to a content-based ID opens the web up to massively distributed storage solutions and trustless data verification methods. So the IPFS content-based address generates that content identifier or CID that I mentioned before. You can think of the CID like a cryptographic fingerprint. To create the CID, IPFS uses a cryptographic hash function to turn each piece of information that we want to put on the network into a unique identifier. This means that every piece of content has its own unique CID of the same size, regardless of the amount of content it represents. And importantly, this CID can be reproduced anytime from the original content. And so we can always verify that the content we've been given is what we asked for, or that we have the right box of cereal. Uh, this means if I create a CID of my favorite meme and then I change even one pixel of that image, I'll have a different CID then. Okay, so now you can make and represent a bunch of content. Let's move on to how we retrieve the content. We retrieve content using a peer-to-peer -peer network where each peer in this network also has their own unique identifier called a peer ID which is again, of course, linked to a cryptographic identity and which allows each peer to communicate securely through an encrypted channel. Uh, if we think about these peers and forget for a moment that we're talking about IPFS and just think about a group of people. If I want to address a person and communicate, it helps if I can identify them, maybe by their name, if we share a common language so that we can communicate and if we have ways to verify that we are who we claim to be. It's the same with IPFS and the peers in the network. Each peer has a unique identifier. This identifier is linked to a cryptographic identity, which allows each peer to communicate securely through an encrypted channel. And in order for peers to be able to discover each other and the network transports that they support, we use a distributed hash table or DHT. If you're an experienced developer, you've likely heard of a hash table, so the distributed version isn't too different, apart from the need for multiple peers to maintain it. In the most simple terms, though, a DHT is like a directory, except that everyone helps maintain it and keep it updated. In order to get the value associated to a key, which in this case would be the CID, a peer asks other peers in the network who has the associated row. Um, it is a bit more efficient than just sort of yelling into the void for it, though, because uh, peers with certain names or peer IDs are more likely to store particular rows. Uh, so the peer knows who's most likely to have it. If that person doesn't, uh, that peer will reach out to the peers they feel is most likely to have it. So you're kind of looking at one big giant spider web of helping you find your data, which is great. Some of this gets pretty technical. Um, if you're interested in a deeper dive, I would encourage you to check out docs.ipfs.tech. If we've already gone deep enough for you, that's okay too. Uh, the main thing to understand here though, is that all of this big brain protocol and networking logic is what makes IPFS a really important and valuable protocol, uh, not just for web three, but also for tech use cases specifically and the web in general. In fact, even Netflix is an IPFS user. It's also valuable for anyone who wants to serve or retrieve content on the web, which is basically all of us, uh, because it enables distribution at scale, provides verifiability of the data, and it allows trustless transactions between users, regardless of any existing social or political distrust. So how do we ensure, though, persistence and permanence of this data? Why would random people help you store your digital content for no reason? And if we're honest, the answer is they probably wouldn't unless there's an incentive for them to do so. So maybe you could pay them or you can just hope they really like your data and wanna share it with everyone. Generally though, despite the usually good intentions of a community, less popular pieces of content will probably stop being hosted and will be no longer easily retrievable. Anyone that has used a torrenting site would immediately relate to this because if you're looking for anything that isn't immediately popular, it can be quite hard to find it. 
Um, one solution to being unable to retrieve content is to pay a pinning service to host our data for us. Unfortunately though, relying on this creates a centralization issue and we end up with the same resilience problem we started the process with. You can also host your own IPFS, which by the way is super simple using the IPFS desktop app. But then every time you close your laptop, your content stops being available. So what is the solution? If you guessed this is where Filecoin comes in, you are correct. Filecoin is a decentralized storage system designed to leverage a crypto economic incentive model together with cryptographic proofs in order to ensure data is stored persistently, highly reliably, and importantly, verifiably across a distributed network. Filecoin currently has over 4,000 storage providers globally and makes up 1% of the world's current data storage capacity, making it the largest decentralized storage solution. So let's dig into this a little bit. Filecoin also makes me thirsty. <laughs> Filecoin is architectured and designed to leverage a crypto economic incentive model together with cryptographic proofs in order to ensure data is stored persistently, reliably, and verifiably across a distributed network. Its use of cryptographic proofs also enables smart contract-based permanence and means that it's designed to be as permanent as you, the data owner, want it to be. Whether that permanence requirement is for 500 years or five minutes, you have total control over the time frame you want for your storage and how many copies of it you want to ensure for resilience. Filecoin is also designed to be hyper-competitive on pricing due to the distributed nature of the storage, the economic reward model, and the efficiency of the market. Uh, the last quote I got was showing that the average cost of storing uh, one petabyte of data works out to less than $4 a month on Filecoin. Um, for reference, this is roughly 5,000 times cheaper than AWS. The network also has internet scale capacity with currently 18 million terabytes. That's almost 1% of total cloud storage capacity and the network is still growing at a very rapid pace. For reference, just one terabyte will hold about 250 movies. So we're talking about a huge amount of storage here. This is enough capacity for almost any use cases. And there are already many organizations and people using Filecoin to store data and even some companies creating roadmaps for commercial models built on Filecoin. Let's look into how Filecoin storage deals work. To make all this work, Filecoin uses Filecoin storage deals, which include two main consensus mechanisms that ensure both rewards for good actors in the system and penalties for bad actors. When you make a deal with one or more storage providers to store your data, the provider generates a proof of replication, which proves the storage provider is storing a unique copy of the original data. Over time, providers must prove that they still have random subsets of this client data and create a proof of space time. And anyone at any time can also check for this proof of space time as well. This proof makes up the mechanism by which miners, who are really the users that are providing storage and retrieval services, are incrementally rewarded with Filecoin. Since these users must also stake Filecoin as collateral to join the network, if they don't provide the proofs, uh, they can be penalized. So that is how we dissuade people from undesirable activity on the network. When the storage deal comes to an end, a user can opt to let it expire or renew the deal. If they opt for renewal, then providers will bid to host this content, which helps create an efficient market for pricing. So this is what builds in not just data permanence, but also data timeframe sovereignty. Um, again, you decide if you wanna store the data for five minutes or 500 years, and you only pay for what you need. So while IPFS and Filecoin are separate projects, they are designed to be complementary. IPFS offers content verifiability with fast and flexible retrievals and Filecoin offers verifiable data persistence at internet scale so that even if your computer or your favorite IPFS pinning service goes away, the content would persist.
All right, so we know that we need to use Filecoin to make sure our project qualifies. And we now know what the heck that means. So how do we do it? <laughs> uh, using these kind of in-depth protocols and blockchains at the base layer can be a challenge even for highly skilled engineers. Um, for those of you who just want to build out of the box, which is definitely the camp that I usually will fall into, uh, there are a bunch of dev tooling options that you can use. Uh, let's first talk about how we access IPFS addresses in web pages. So how do I access IPFS in my browser? If you're using a browser like Brave or Opera, they have built-in support for IPFS. You can paste a CID directly into Brave and you will find the content. Um, otherwise, you'll use an IPFS HTTP gateway. And there are a bunch of providers for those. Um, we have some that we host ourselves, Cloudflare, Infura, NFT Storage, and Fleek also make those available. Basically, these gateways are just a language translator. Think of it like using a Spanish to English dictionary. And we need a way for HTTP websites to understand IPFS, and that's what the gateways do. All right, so let's dig into some tools that make IPFS CIDs and Filecoin deals for you, and uh, that even offer storage for free, as well as making it super simple for you to create your decentralized apps. Luckily, some very talented engineers have made a few tools to make this whole thing easier to navigate. We like to call them storage helpers. And two of my favorites are NFT storage and Web3 storage. Storing your NFT metadata immutably and permanently, as you may know, is integral to keeping the main value proposition of NFTs, their non-fungibility. As the name suggests, this is exactly what NFT.storage has been built for. NFT storage was specifically created as a public good to archive and persist NFT data, and it takes care of the complexity around firstly creating an IPFS CID for your NFT metadata, and then it makes an automatic deal to store the content persistently on Filecoin with eight or more times redundancy and a multi-generational time frame. Over 25 million NFTs are currently stored on NFT storage, and it's used by both OpenSea and Magic Eden, to name a few. It's also currently free, and the team is working on a feature to include a perpetual renewal of Filecoin storage deals, which can be triggered, for example, through a smart contract. So you won't even need to trust a centralized entity with renewal either. Uh, if you're interested in using this, my colleague Ali also has a starter kit demo project on GitHub, which deploys both ERC-721 and ERC-1155 NFTs on multi-chain with NFT storage. You can check that out on GitHub under Developer Alley. So what about data that isn't for NFTs though? This is where Web3 Storage comes in. Web3 Storage is another project built by IPFS and Filecoin and is designed to give you all the benefits of decentralized storage and IPFS content addressing with the frictionless experience you expect in a modern storage solution. It's compatible with both JavaScript and Go client libraries. Web3 Storage offers a free tier, which gives you up to five gigabytes of storage, which is plenty to get most of your hackathon projects off the ground. I am also pretty pumped up about some new features that they've recently rolled out. Uh, the first is W3UI. It gives you headless type safe UI components to make it even easier to use IPFS and Filecoin to address and store your application data. It's currently in beta, but the available modules include a uh, key ring, which is a UCAN based authentication and delegation module, uploader, which helps you load files to IPFS and Filecoin from your app, and the uploads list, which lets you have paginated listings of items that you have uploaded to the ser service, uh, optionally filterable and sortable by multiple fields. D Excuse me, W3Name is a service and client library that implements IPNS, which is a protocol that uses public key cryptography to allow for updatable naming in an atomically verifiable way. This service abstracts away the broadcasting and resolution of updates for you, making your application faster and more performant. And last but not least is W3Link, 
This service marries IPFS content IDs with CDNs to provide a much more performant reading experience. It's designed to be especially fast if your content is stored on Web3 storage. So yeah, a lot of new toys from this team. I'm excited to see how these tools can help you all build bigger, better, and faster apps. And this is the bummer part where I have to make a little public service announcement. Are you ready? All right, please, please, please only submit something if you've built it during the event. Um, part of the challenge of these events is the time constraints and it just isn't good sportsmanship to dodge them. Um, if you have an existing project out there and you're building the equivalent of a new project on top of that, uh, please spell that out clearly in your readme file. Explain what you had before the hack and what you've added. Um, if you have finished a project and you're looking to take next steps on it, uh, we have grant programs for exactly that use case. And you can learn more about those at hackathons.filecoin.io. Uh, otherwise, I end up having to disqualify <laughs> duplicate entry projects and it makes me sad and sad judges don't benefit anyone. <laughs> okay. Whew. So we have an idea. We now know it will qualify. And now we have to figure out how to make a banger of a presentation that will just wow the judges, win us some prizes, and launch us to new heights never before imagined. Um, that probably won't all happen, but we do want to win, right? So let's talk about how to maximize our chances of walking away with some sweet, sweet bounties. When you hit submit, your hackathon journey is all over except the waiting but your judge's job is just getting started. Uh, the number of entries can vary from event to event, but it's not uncommon for us to evaluate hundreds of entries for a handful of available bounties. Time is obviously at a premium in this scenario, so the first thing I'm going to do is make sure that your project is qualified before I do anything else. One of the best pieces of advice I can give you is to make this part as easy for your judges as possible. The first step is a solid readme. Um, I can almost hear you all groaning because we all hate to write them, uh, but it is worth it in this scenario. Tell me the problem your app solves and how you've solved it. Tell me the tech stack you used to build it. Be detailed when you talk about how you use the tech related to the bounty uh, track. I literally want to look at the code that applies. So if you can tell me which file that is in, that's even better. Make sure your project lives in a single repo link and that that repo is public. If I can't look at the code, I can't verify the usage of the qualifying tech. If I can't verify the usage of the tech, I can't give you a prize. And I really like giving away other people's money. So please help me help you. And show me something. I know, I know a lot of us suck at front end and we'd rather take a beating than style a UI. I understand. Uh, I can't express enough though what visuals mean in this setting. Show me your creation. I don't care if your front end dev was abducted by aliens and now I'm looking at a Figma design prototype. That is okay. Um, I want to see what you envision the app looking like and how it's intended to work for the end user. Everyone wants to come out of this with a beautiful live app, but sometimes it just doesn't happen. So diagrams, pictures, wireframes, just give me something to look at along with your code so I can understand your vision. And if you remember the time crunch issue that I mentioned, uh, ideally your video will be under five minutes. Uh, I don't just say this because it makes my life easier, <laughs> even though it does, but Learning how to concisely share your problem, your solution, and your future goals for a project is a skill that will help you win in the workplace and with potential investors if that's your goal. Be concise, stick to the important stuff. I know sometimes blockchain transaction times can eat up a bit of a demo, so you may have to work in a little editing and chop a little bit of that out to work if, if that's where you're at. And I wanna know what's next. Do you have any future plans for this concept? Not everyone does and that's okay. Uh, if you do though, tell me about them. What additional features might you add if you made a version two? What did you want to add, but you just ran out of time to do it? If this was a fun experiment and that's it, cool. 
if you would love to make this idea into a startup, I wanna know that too. In addition, if you've made something that will move the space forward and you're interested in continuing down that path, we want to know so we can help you do that through grants and developer support. So share your goals and let's see if we can get you there together. Okay, so you now know all the deep dark secrets to what you might build, how to ensure your project is Filecoin bounty eligible, and some hot tips on making sure your judges love your submission. You are ready to go forth and conquer this thing. If you have any questions or need help, I am trying to keep an eye on the Hackathon support channel and the Chainlink Discord server, but um, I do invite you to at me if I'm not responding quickly enough there. Uh, sometimes I do struggle to keep up with Discord. I also have my DMs open on Twitter, so you can find me there if you like. Um, my at is run for pancakes. I'll tell you it's R-U-N and then the number four in pancakes. Uh, had some people get tripped up on that before. Uh, that is it for me. I deeply appreciate your time and attention. And uh, I guess if anybody has questions, Patrick, I'll take those. Awesome. Thank you so much, Don. And love your slides, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, some great pictures in there and some great advice, too. So, everyone listening, um, definitely take, go back and listen to this presentation again. And there's some really good gold nuggets in there about how to be successful for this hackathon um and all future hackathons i know I, my very first one that i did was i think f wyoming in 2015 was the first like f hackathon that i did and i'm telling you this is the way to get a foot in the door and network with all the projects that are sponsors and and connect with don and everyone else who's presented and a great opportunity to find a job or, or build something really cool so really excited to see what everyone builds and also with that said too this weekend is the most important weekend to get a good head start on your project uh one yes. of the that, that don mentioned was oh you kind of get back in rushing into time and don't know where to, to go if you get a good head start this weekend um it'll really help you i agree yes absolutely um, cool. And then I think someone was asking if you would be able to share the slides. Um, maybe if you um, want to put in the yeah. Discord or if they have questions, they could just drop it in. Yeah, yeah. I could throw that in the Discord, sure. Yeah. Cool. Um, otherwise, Don, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. And you guys reach out if you need any help at all, okay? Thanks, awesome. Patrick. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> have a good Bye. rest of your day. Bye.